Greetings and welcome to Space Week episode 118 on this Sunday, May 15th, 2022. I'm your host, Raw Space. Uh, first of all, as always, this is a live question and answer session, so if you have any questions for me, please make sure to tag my name at Raw Space, and we'll be sure to uh, collate those questions and I'll get to them at the end of the show. So let's start out with the big scientific news of the week. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope team made a major announcement via coordinated press conferences in seven locations around the world of the release of their, uh, their findings of the analysis of data regarding the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. So at the centers of most galaxies, it is believed, there is a supermassive black hole. Um, our supermassive black hole is called Sagittarius A star. It's located in our sky in the region um, sort of behind the Sagittarius constellation. And its mass is about 4 million times that of our sun. Uh, but being a black hole, it is not easily visible. Also, we're looking at it edge on through the uh, many light years of dust and debris that make up the spiral arms of our galaxy. So this is the very first image, direct image, of our galaxy's black hole, and only the second direct image of any black hole, uh, the first of which was released by this same team of a few hundred uh, scientists around the world, the Event Horizon Telescope team, a couple of years ago. Um, where they released the image of, what was it, M81 uh, galaxy's black hole, but this one is ours. So uh, what you're looking at is very fuzzy, uh, and that is because this is 
the result of a highly complex and ex extensive analysis of um, data gathered by this telescope. Uh, we can't just simply just take a picture of it, you know, point the Hubble at it or, or the James Webb Space Telescope and take a picture. Although I'm sure that James Webb will be spending some time, uh, some not insignificant amount of time, peering at the center of our galaxy. But, uh, so what we're seeing here is, they call it the shadow of the event horizon. So we can't see the black hole itself because uh, beyond the event horizon, light cannot escape. Uh, because of the the crushing pull of uh, of gravity, which is the definition of a black hole, but um, uh, around the outside, uh, or rather outside of the event horizon, is a large and swirling accretion disk of ma of material, uh, not not unlike the accretion disk which formed our own solar system uh, some billions of years ago. So. Uh, this material is very hot and uh, very luminescent. And as you can see from the image, it is not uniformly luminescent. It, it's got these white or these uh, brighter blobs uh, in roughly equidistant positions around the center. And, um, and that is the result of uh, very complex gravitational um, uh, mechanisms that I couldn't even begin to explain. <laughs> but, but I'm sure the Event Horizon Telescope team could uh, could give you a, a, a doctoral dissertation on, on why those three lumps exist. Um, now, the M81 photo, which we saw a couple of years ago, featured one main lump kind of on one side, uh, and they did have an explanation for that, but at least during the um, uh, the pr uh, the press conference uh, for this release, they did not uh, go into too terribly much detail, uh, as I recall, explaining the... Um, I could have missed it because I was kind of multitasking, but, but they didn't go into too much detail explaining why, why there are those three uh, clumps of... of extra luminous material. Now at the center uh, you see, I mean it looks like a donut, at the center you see the dark area. Uh, we're not seeing the actual black hole, but what we're seeing is um, an absence or a, a, a lesser amount of luminous material in the center uh, because that's where the black hole, that's where the the actual black hole is. So we're we're seeing the uh, uh, negative presence of, of the material surrounding the black hole. But anyway, this is a, a like, it's not much to look at, but scientifically speaking, this is a monumental achievement. The very first uh, uh, direct imaging of our galaxy's black hole. Uh, and it's, uh, th there's a, a wealth of data that is not represented in this particular image, and in fact, this image is is a compilation of of you know many. Uh, I think they said petabytes, didn't they? Of 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 data that they that they uh, aggregated and analyzed in order to come up with this. But um, uh, in any case, uh, the EHT team has done a wonderful job of. Uh, uh, achieving their, their mission objectives, and, and hopefully we'll see um, further images with more clarity in the future. Maybe James Webb can, can, uh, can assist with that. But um, yeah, so I, for one, very excited about the black hole stuff. Uh, rewinding to a couple of weeks ago, because uh, there was not a Space Week episode last week due to Mother's Day and family obligations, uh, Rocket Lab launched their There and Back Again mission. Aboard the uh, Electron rocket were 34 commercial payloads from ALBA Orbital, Asterix Astronautics, Aurora Propulsion Technologies, eSpace, Unseen Labs, and Swarm Technologies. First, let's check out the launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 
five, four, three, two, one. And we have liftoff. Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 31 seconds into the mission, an electron is airborne after our 26th launch from LC-1. Now, what set this mission apart from other uh, electron launches was that for the first time ever, Rocket Lab would try to capture Electron's first stage in mid-air by snagging its drogue parachute line with a hook dangling from a Sikorsky S-92 helicopter. Let's see what happened. Uh, look at that view before we do. Look at that view from uh, uh, the ascending uh, rocket stage of the North Island of New Zealand. And here is the capture. I don't know about all of you viewing, but the longer I watch this line waiting for that hello, the uh, parachute to come in. Oh. Oh, there we go. We've got our first glimpse of it. So the plan was for the helicopter to gently lower the one-ton booster to the deck of the recovery ship, or perhaps bring it back to shore. While it wasn't immediately clear from the video, after they successfully captured the rocket, uh, the helicopter pilot released the booster after encountering, quote, different load characteristics, unquote, than experienced during previous tests. Now, Rocket Lab had already tested their mid-air capture using a dummy booster, so it's unclear what load characteristics were sufficiently different that the pilot felt it necessary to let go of the real, of the real booster. Uh, maybe the wind was blowing it around and yanking, the heli yanking on the helicopter more than they felt was safe. But uh, uh, in any case, he did release the booster after cap capturing it, and um, the booster did safely splash down under its parachute, and Rocket Lab fished it out of the ocean for analysis and refurbishment. Uh, now, a side note about the helicopter. That's not a helicopter. <laughs> While the name Sikorsky might lead one to assume that the helicopter is Russian or Ukrainian, Sikorsky is actually an American company founded in 1923 in New York State, uh, currently headquartered in, in Connecticut. Uh, Igor Sikorsky was born in 1889 in Kiev, in what was then the Tsarist Russian Empire, which then proceeded through a series of names during the Russian Revolutionary Period starting in 1917, becoming the Soviet Union in 1922, until the USSR's collapse in 1991, when Kiev became the capital of a newly independent Ukraine. Sikorsky himself, however, immigrated to the, to the United States in 1919 during the Refer Russian Revolutionary period. Now the company is a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. Just wanted to clear that up because I myself uh, wasn't aware of the history of the Sikorsky, helic of the Sikorsky Aviation Company. Uh, and in fact, Sikorsky is also the manufacturer of the famous Black Hawk helicopter, amongst many others. On Thursday, May 5th, a Long March 2D launched a Zhilin-1 Quanfu-1C Earth observation satellite and seven Zhilin-1 Gaofen 3F2733 high-resolution remote sensing satellites from Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northern China.
and there we see the typical insulation panels falling off. Those are not uh, chunks of ice, but rather like foam insulation panels. Now, <clears throat> also on May 5th, oh, let's see, also on the 5th, Crew 3 members Raja Chari, Thomas Marshburn, Matthias Maurer, and Kayla Barron returned to Earth from their six-month expedition on the International Space Station. The SpaceX Crew Dragon Endurance undocked at 9.05 UTC. About 23 and a half hours later, they splashed down right on time at 4.43 UTC on the 6th in the Gulf of Mexico near Tampa, Florida. Uh, here is the parachute sequence. Well, actually, before we look at that, here are some sweet views of the, uh, well, there were some sweet views of the uh, ISS as Crew Dragon pulled away. And here is the parachute deployment sequence. Great image of those drogues deploying. All right, looks like we have two healthy drogues there. And then George, the visual on two drogues. Copy, we see the same. Descent rate nominal. And if you noticed, as those drogues were Copy deploying, no, the drogues didn't open up to that full size you saw all the way at first. It's called reefing. Uh, they open up more slowly so that it's not as big of a jolt to the capsule and to the parachute system. And again, these will help slow the capsule to 350 miles per hour, which still seems fast, but compared to 17,500. There we can see the deployment of those main parachutes. <laughs> the vehicle's velocity is about 119 miles per hour. Yeah, SpaceX Dragon, we see four chutes, and we could distinctly feel the two disc reefs. It looks like final descent reefs. Yeah, that reefing action that you just mentioned uh, playing out. Beautiful deployment there. And now let's fast forward a couple of minutes to the splashdown. Um, it's going to take them a little bit of time to get there in terms of the large vessel, but there is a fast boat, as we call it, um, that will be able to get to the capsule very, very quickly, as we will see here in just a couple of moments. Once again, all right, as you can see there on your screen, Dragon Endurance during Endurance three. Week. Copy, we see the same and main attack. Crew 3 crew has splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. A little bobbing, uh, a little seasickness, but uh, otherwise calm seas. Now, uh, I wanted to also show uh, a clip from the re recovery of Crew Dragon. So the last, memory, the last member of the recovery crew to secure the capsule to the recovery ship's crane egresses or exits the capsule by spider monkeying his way to the top and leaping from about 15 feet high into the water. So this person's about to make their egress <laughs> from the capsule momentarily. <laughs> Whoop. Tally ho. There we go. Alonzi. Dragon SpaceX. Alonzi. Um, pretty, pretty cool job. Uh, I couldn't do it, but uh, good for him. So uh, just a few hours later, SpaceX launched a batch of 53 more Starlink satellites from Kennedy Space Center. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and lift off. 
vehicle is pitching down range. M1D chamber pressure is nominal. Even at night, I love the uh, the booster cam views looking down at the uh, the launch site. And here is the landing. Stage one landing burn. So stage one has begun its landing burn. This is its final burn before touchdown to land on the the drone ship. This burn lasts about 20 seconds as well. I'll look at that a clear view. Landing leg deploy. Ah, oh, beautiful. Stage and, one landing confirmed. And stage one has successfully landed okay. on our drone ship, a short fall of Gravitas. This is the 111th recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage booster. And then last Monday, a Long March 7 launched the Tianzhou 4 cargo mission to the Chinese space station from Wenchang Satellite Launch Center in the far south of the country. This was the, and here is the docking. This was the third cargo mission to autonomously dock to CSS's Tianhe core module. Oop, I guess that's all the video we get from the docking. All right. On Wednesday, there was a suborbital launch of a NASA Endurance research rocket from the Anduya Space Launch Site at Ni Olesund on the far northern island of Svalbard, Norway, situated well above the Arctic Circle, just shy of 79 degrees north latitude, which you can see at the top of this screen. Uh, its main mission was to investigate and measure Earth's electrical field to determine to what extent the ionosphere leaks water into space. The sounding rocket reached an altitude of 767 kilometers, or 476 miles, almost twice as high as the ISS. Remember, a rocket can be suborbital, but still reach very high altitudes. Orbit, or going around the Earth rather than just arcing up and back down, requires much more speed, and thus more fuel, and a larger rocket. Here's the launch. And there's actually no sound, so... Note the moon peeking up over the mountain there. There's your sound effect for, for you. And that's it. Short and sweet, but starkly beautiful. Um, aren't too many launches from that far north, so this one was, uh, was noteworthy for sure. Then on Friday, SpaceX launched yet another batch of Starlinks from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California.
Now, the video signal cut out for the first stage booster landing on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, but we did get some nice views of California's Pacific coastline uh, during re-entry, as you can see here at two times speed, as well as you might have caught the uh, payload fairing falling away there. Last, <clears throat> last but not least, yesterday SpaceX launched uh, another batch of Starlinks, this time from Cape Canaveral in Florida, with a brand new first stage booster, <clears throat> which you can tell because it's pristine white rather than blackened with soot. Uh, most Starlink launches are done with reused boosters. Ten, nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. And lift off. Go Falcon, go Starlink. Falcon is fishing down range. M1D chamber pressures are nominal. Now this time we got a gorgeous uninterrupted view of the drone ship landing from the booster's perspective. Check this out. This is one of the best landing uh, sequences uh, we've seen. Here we go, exciting view from the first stage. We'll expect to see entry burn startup, or excuse me, landing burn startup here. Stage one landing burn. So there's ignition of the center Merlin engine. You can see the grid fins helping guide us towards the drone ship. Now we'll expect to see the landing legs deploy just before we Stage touch down. Two, terminal guidance. You can see that our speed is rapidly Stage coming down to zero. Deploy. There's landing leg deploy. Oh, and a lovely touchdown. This booster's first landing, the 100th and 11th recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage booster. Love that footage. Uh, the booster cam is um, um, is uh, I guess more dramatic uh, to to see than the the drone ship cam, and I'm glad they had it full screen. Now uh, there was no video coverage of the Starlink deployment, uh, as has become the norm recently. This is presumably due to the approximate hour long coast phase coast phase placing the upper stage far from any ground stations. Uh, many earlier Starlink deployments took place within 20 minutes or so of the launch when the vehicle was, much, was uh, fairly close to the launch site still uh, and within range of, of uh, ground stations. But um, now, oops, looking further back into space history, um, Yesterday marked the 49th anniversary of the last Saturn V launch. On May 14, 1973, the United States' first space station, Skylab, was launched into orbit. However, it was only occupied for about 24 weeks <clears throat> until February 1974. Its orbit slowly decayed until finally it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in 1979 over the Indian Ocean and Western Australia. Now, looking ahead to this week, uh, tonight, Sunday, May 15th, starting at 11 p.m. Eastern, 0300 UTC, I'll be bringing you NASA coverage of the total lunar eclipse, which will be visible in its entirety from all of South America and the eastern half of North America. The eclipse maximum occurs at 12.14 a.m. Eastern, or 04.14 UTC. On Tuesday, May 17th, at 12 p.m. Eastern, 1600 UTC, though the time is subject to change, 
begins this week's series of Boeing Starliner OFT2 events with a pre-launch news conference. Normally I don't live stream NASA news conferences, but Starliner has traveled such a long road that I felt it would be appropriate this time. Then on, then on Wednesday, uh, May 18th at 6.40 p.m. Eastern, 2240 UTC, SpaceX launches another batch of Starlink satellites, this time from Kennedy Space Center again. Uh, finally, on Thursday, uh, May 19th at 6.54 p.m. Eastern, 2254 UTC, is the launch of a ULA Atlas V with Boeing CST-100 Starliner Orbital Flight Test 2, or OFT-2, bound for the International Space Station. Live coverage starts about an hour earlier. Now, <clears throat> as you may recall, Starliner OFT-1 launched back in December 2019, almost two and a half years ago, but a major issue with its internal clock caused it to freak out and waste most of its attitude control fuel, preventing a rendezvous with the ISS. What happened was uh, its internal clock thought that it was actually, that the mission time was 11 hours later than it actually was, and so it was uh, frantically firing its um, RCS thrusters in order to get to where it thought it was supposed to be 11 hours hence. Um, but... Uh, uh, now, they were able to safely, they, they orbited the Earth a couple of times. Uh, they were able to safely deorbit uh, Starliner and land it in New Mexico. Uh, later during a test, Boeing discovered an issue, a fundamental issue, with uh, some of Starliner's fuel valves, which caused the valves to corrode and stick due to um, nitrogen gas forming nitric, uh, nitric acid, which uh, corroded the valves and caused them to, to, to be unable to open. Um, so after troubleshooting that, the launch of OF2 was delayed numerous times throughout 2020 and 2021, but now finally may be Boeing's moment to shine, barring any additional complications. So fingers crossed for Boeing. Then a couple of hours later, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 0100 UTC is the Starliner post-launch news conference. And again, I'll be bringing that to you as well. Friday morning, May 20th at 930 Eastern, 1330 UTC, Blue Origin's New Shepard will launch another crew of six paying customers into suborbital space. On board will be Evan Dick on his second flight aboard New Shepard, Katya Echazareta, who will become the first Mexican-born woman and the youngest American woman to fly to space, Hamish Harding, Jason Robinson, Victor Vescovo, and Brazilian Victor Correa Hispanha. Also on Friday, uh, starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 1930 UTC, is coverage of Boeing Starliner OFT-2's rendezvous and docking to the ISS. Coverage will last about four hours until Starliner is docked. Then on Saturday, May 21st, at 1130 a.m. Eastern, 1530 UTC. Oops. Oops. Let me spell it right. 1530 UTC is coverage of the hatch opening of Boeing Starliner, followed by welcoming, welcoming remarks by the ISS crew. All right, so I wanna take a, take a moment to thank and welcome our newest channel member, Upon My Word. Thank you for your support. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, if you wish to become a channel member, just click the join button and show your support for the content that we provide. We meaning I. <laughs> um, all right, so questions. What have you got? Let's see here. Okay. Yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. All right, I am not seeing collated questions. 
Okay, so I'm going to have to scan the chat. Um, our auto question collator uh, apparently didn't do its thing, so um, let me just scan for questions real quick. And again, if you don't tag my name at raw space, then uh, very likely we will we will not see your question, and I won't be able to get to it. All right, so a question from Thomas T. Can, oh Thomas T. Can James Webb take any kind of photo of the black hole? So here's the thing: James Webb is an infrared telescope, unlike uh, Hubble, which was primarily an optical telescope that could dip into the near infrared. Uh, James Webb can go much deeper into the infrared range of the elect of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so uh, one of the benefits of infrared imaging in space is that you can sort of cut through the dust. Um, and that's why, amongst other th reasons, that's why the image you saw of the black hole, the Sag Sagittarius A star black hole at the center of the Milky Way is red is because they have to look at it in infrared wavelengths. And um, so, yes, James Webb can absolutely uh, point its mirrors toward the, the galactic core and uh, uh, see what it can see of the uh, uh, Sagittarius A star region. Now, it's unlikely that James Webb will be able to, um, you know, get the same kind of image that we see there from the Event Horizon Telescope team because that image was assembled from you know many terabytes of of data and and years of of processing and analysis by supercomputers um, but yes uh, we, we may be able to see something from James Webb and I'll be excited to see uh, what they come up with I'm sure that uh, Sagittarius A star <clears throat> is one of their prime initial targets for James Webb uh, if if it's pointed in the right direction like uh, I don't because uh, James Webb has to look away from the Sun and uh, based on where Earth is in its orbit around the Sun it's pointing at a different region of the sky at any given time of year and so uh, in order to image the galactic core um, uh, that region would need to be in the James Webb's field of view uh, at the time, you know, pointed directly away from the sun because it can't like turn around and and point toward the sun because it'll it'll <laughs> it'll be damaged and ruined. All right. Uh, now, Rock and Robbins thirteen commenting on the black hole image during the official presentation. They said the three lumps <clears throat> weren't to be taken literally. They are concentrations, but not the ones. There are concentrations, but not the ones you see here. So, um, uh, the full explanation of, of why we see those bright regions, uh, roughly equi equidistant around the 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 core of the black hole is likely um, uh, would go way over our heads <laughs> and uh, would take would take probably quite some time to, to fully explain so suffice it to say that uh, um, the experts the scientists who did this they know what they're looking at and, and um, we can just be awed that they did so it's kind of like <clears throat> interpreting um, particle trails from, you know, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, I mean, I don't know what I'm looking at, but the scientists do, so that's what counts. Uh, Thomas T., wouldn't it be easier to catch if the rock, this is referring to electron, if the rocket slows completely down like during the landing burn of the Falcon 9? Uh, so the rocket is descending on the parachute um, at a pretty low rate of speed. Uh, there's a few minutes from the time the parachute deploys to the time it splashes down. And so they actually have a lot of time to catch it with the helicopter. But um, uh, 
I, the, it isn't des, it isn't designed or intended to perform a landing burn, and I don't know, like I don't know what the capabilities of the the uh, Rutherford engines on the Electron are if they would, you know, be able to uh, to relight for for a basically a slow down burn during the and what the, what effect that would have on the par like if if the rocket because the parachute's going to continue to fall under the force of gravity and, and with the resistance of, of the air pressure. So if the rocket were to perform a stopping burn midair, the rocket would maybe slow down and stop descending, but the parachute would continue descending, which would cause all sorts of problems with the orientation of the rocket and the ability of the helicopter to catch it. Um, you know, I mean, the, the the parachute would get tangled up in the rocket, probably burned by the the uh, the exhaust, the the thrust from the the, the engines, uh, and most importantly, the drogue the little drogue parachute, which uh, provides tension on the the parachute line that is caught by the helicopter hook, would be thrown into disarray. And the helicopter wouldn't be able to reliably uh, catch it. So, uh, an interesting idea, but um, but the 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 helicopter they used is it is a beefy machine, and it it should be um, perfectly capable of catching and and retaining the rocket. So I'm I'm sure they'll have a a success maybe next time around. Um, you know, maybe maybe the pilot was exercising an abundance of caution. Um, you know, it's possible that even if he was being jerked to and fro, that uh, that uh, there may still have been uh, an acceptable safety margin. But uh, he made a you know in the moment decision that you know ultimately it didn't result in the loss of the booster. They still recovered the booster, just a little wetter and saltier than they had hoped. All right. Uh, so Yazata asked about where the Chinese booster fell. Uh, we covered a couple of Chinese launches here, but but um, so Chinese launches from Wenchang, uh, the boosters, the first stage boosters, just fall into the ocean. But because Wenchang is on the coast, it's China's only uh, coastal launch site, uh, only major coast, coastal launch site. But from their inland launch sites, uh, the boosters do come down uh, in sort of random places in, in the interior of China. But um, China has implemented uh, parachutes that allow them to better control where the boosters come down and the 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 violence which would like you know instead of just cratering and and exploding on impact uh, they actually come down on parachutes and uh, they attempt to land them in unpopulated uh, areas so you know they they do take measures to um, to uh, mitigate the risk all right C. Johnson, thank you for the kind words. Uh, you know, 500 K subs may come sometime, but uh, <laughs> need to get some more views before that can happen. Uh, Tig said, uh, and this is regarding the the uh, sounding rocket launch, Finland space program. No, this was a a Norwegian research facility on the island, the, Nor the Norwegian island of Svalbard, um, and the rocket was from NASA, but they needed to launch it very far north, and so they, they picked a location that was, that was available, which was the Norwegian launch, uh, or the Norwegian research facility on Svalbard. Uh, 
Julian Roberts asks, do you have the tracking for the Eclipse to stream? So um, there are, you know, a couple of uh, a couple of outlets that provide live Eclipse coverage. I will be bringing you NASA's coverage. Um, I, in the past, a couple of times have used Time and Date's coverage, timeanddate.com's coverage, but I, I really prefer not to. Uh, not to piggyback on their hard work. Um, and so instead, I'll be, bring, I'll be bringing you the NASA coverage of the lunar eclipse. And so that begins at 11 p.m. Eastern tonight. <laughs> Yazata hopes that Starliner works this time because the US the US needs all the broomsticks it can get. All right. Uh, Mark Desaire says I believe they caught pictures sent down by spy satellites with aircraft in the 1960s. Uh, so uh, film canisters uh, descending from orbit on parachutes and being caught by, by aircraft, that seems possible. I, I don't, I'm not specifically familiar with that, with the, with that piece of history, but uh, that sounds like something they would have done. Uh, Tig, so will the Webb telescope be able to see Vulcan or Kronos? Just kidding. Uh, sure, <laughs> why not? Maybe we'll see Vulcan transit in front of its its uh, parent star. All right, so it looks like that will about wrap it up for this week. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you your presence, and um. I hope to catch you in the next live stream, which will be the lunar eclipse this evening. And until then, or until next week, keep it raw, take care, and bye-bye.